So, ladies and gentlemen, first edition, life of an Hindustani Shiv Kunal Verma in conversation with Sandeep Unit and both of them are on stage. This is presented by Blue One Inc. The stage is all yours, Unitan. Thank you, thank you, Rajesh. Welcome, Kunal. It's good to see you after so many years, and uh, you're looking good on that cover, Mr. Lee. <laughs> Thanks. So, uh, Kunal might not remember this, but I first met him over 20 years ago. Uh, I was a reporter in the Indian Express, Mumbai. We were off the coast of Mumbai on the aircraft carrier INS Virat, and uh, this was a day at sea. We were, you know, uh, covering the naval exercises there, and we wanted to go back to base. And uh, we were told that there's a helicopter, but uh, you can't go back till it comes back. So where's the helicopter? Oh, it's gone off for a photo shoot. With who? Kunal Verma. Who's Kunal Verma? You'll know when he comes. So uh, we said, why can't you call the helicopter back? We have to go. There's so many of us. Says, so we turned to the naval PRO and uh, he says, what can I do? He's come from Delhi. <laughs> you know, so that was the thing. For us in Mumbai to be exposed to the Delhi journalists, the Delhi defense journalists who had it all sorted out in life. They were, you know, the cat's whiskers. They had full access to the powers that be. So uh, Kunal, of course, has spent many, many years uh, in Delhi. He's uh, been one of our, uh, you know, foremost photojournalists, uh, filmmakers, defense journalists. Uh, so we, I followed his career very closely. And of course, this book that he's uh, written, is, is, it's, it's fascinating. It's a roller coaster through India of the 1980s until the present day. It's got a lot of characters that you might recognize and remember. Um, you know, and it's it's a very unique kind of uh, you know storytelling uh, that, of a kind that I've not seen before. You know, it's it's a semi-autobiography. It's got a lot of life in it. It's got a lot of uh, you, you know history. It's got political personalities that we know of, told through the eyes of uh, uh, you know Kunal. So uh, you know, Kunal, tell me a little more about this book. How did you come up about writing this book? You're a military historian, right? I've read your books on 62, 65. Siachen, how did this book come about? Well, basically, uh, I have always firmly believed that autobiographies are an ego trip. Um, I had worked on one before, with, I'm not saying that was an ego trip, but I had worked on General V.K. Singh's book earlier, I, I was his co-author. And I have always felt that, okay, you know, uh, autobiography, these are a high putty Kismet series, ki I was born in a year, ho jata, to year ho jata, that kind of a stuff. So I wasn't very hung up on doing a uh, autobiography and especially you know when you're just turning 60 you don't exactly think you should be sitting there right? most people associate autobiography when you're much older but uh, uh, my publisher Pankaj and Anirudh Takarwati who was uh, they were setting up Blue One Inc at that time we all felt that uh, this was not so much of an autobiography per se it was more of a contemporary history I'm a military historian and this is one way of telling the story 1984, for, for example, you know, it's something which has really rankled in my head. Yeah. The, the, the book starts with the sea crimes. What happened, we, I actually had the list of what was going to happen, the, 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 the targets for Kirlokpuri the next day. So that's the prologue of the book and then, you know, we come back to that in chapter 7 or 8 or whatever it is. Uh, it was, once I started writing it, I, I realized that, okay, then here, here we what was happening, because you know, my generation, which was born in 1960, we lived through some of the most important conflicts which have happened. My dad's battalion was involved in 1962. For me, it was a, I grew up in that environment, 65, 71. It's just been continuous. And then also, I was never a defense journalist, by the way. I was, uh, I was a filmmaker and I was working with them quite independently. I never belonged to any organization other than that very short stint with India Today, with which you also worked, and uh, later with Associated Press. Um, but I've never been part of an organization that way. And to that extent, I think I was very lucky that I got opportunity upon opportunity upon opportunity, and I eventually I mean, landed up with more fighter sorties than I think anybody else could possibly have. More than the fighter pilots, I noticed. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I've told every type. Uh, we would have also got to fly the Rafael because when uh, Chief Marshal. Uh, Duria was the chief, but unfortunately COVID happened, so we couldn't make a third film. I would have loved to have done. But you know, Kunal, you mentioned the 1980s. Now, this is the interesting thing. A lot of us, I was born in the 70s. 
for me the 80s was all about mile sur mera tumhara and you know the bajaj advertisements and all of that and if half of india was not born then right the 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 young people here in the audience i don't think many of you know what the 80s was all about and when you look back at mile sur mera tumhara you think everything is fine hunky dory you know land of milk and honey and all that but those were really terrible times you know i mean you're looking at communal riots separatism the indian army deployed to fight counter insurgency punjab was on fire you had the ipkf in sri lanka the northeast was on fire but you know what you mentioned about punjab i just wanted to go back to 1984 you had a ringside view on three very significant events of the 80s right but i want to uh, read out what you wrote about the 1984 riots i thought i'd read everything about the 1984 riots which you called india's darkest hour but these lines from your book were absolutely blood chilling you know i mean i'm just going to read it out just how systematic the killings were can be judged from the fact that there were no large mobs going wild just small groups of about a dozen men who were going about the gruesome business they seemed to have divided areas among themselves and knew exactly what they were doing i mean this is absolutely appalling i mean this this kind of thing a popular imagery suggests a riot where hundreds of people are you know no, going no. around and killing people but this suggests there were small bands of men like commandos going from house to house and killing people absolutely i mean it was uh, in fact the uh, first thing that happened i mean i was with the associated press and i went into the office at that time it is now the dlf building in parliament street but that time it was called another in the place it was a barrack like thing yellow building and samuel who would always be sitting there was not there that day it was almost like you know who krishan ji sa wo akashwani and all that ki darwaze khul gaye samuel was never miss never away from that chair was not there and there i my gaze fell on this piece of paper which was a sheet of sheets of paper which were folded lengthwise and well i'm not a compulsive thief i've never stolen anything other than you know 10 bucks from my mom's wallet or something like that but i just had to pick it up and i did and i shoved it in my jacket pocket and then we were right next to jantar mantar and i was on a scooter and i looked at it and i said if it's something useless i'll go and put it back but here was a list the previous evening of that's the day mr gandhi had been killed about to look for it it was the it was the uh, election uh, thing right. and if one had any doubt there were none because there were five or six names in the circle and it said do not kill in pencil and i immediately realized what the hell is this and uh, i had a choice actually at that moment one was put it back get the camera be in tirukkuri i mean that's it you know um, it did cross my mind i'll be honest but the but there was a larger calling i mean i simply had to do something about it and i didn't know what so i headed off for i used to play squash with the adcs and stuff like that and uh, jamie jamwal who i think you also know was the naval adc and his father was the delhi area commander he had been with my dad in uh, staff college so we were all like you know how it is in the army and i just had to get this list to somebody so first i went to rashtrapati bhavan you are going to believe it there was not a single cop not a, i just went i just went parked on the steps went up those steps and there was a lone jco adc sitting there and i saw gyani ji there and i went across to him and i said i had said to him i said sir but he was drunk he had no idea what was going on he looking at me vacantly then this adc came and said sabun ko chhod do unko dawai diya hua hai and then i went and lay down in uh, sat down in jamie's room and i fell asleep and then uh, maybe 10 minutes later he came and said what the hell are you doing here i showed him the list he didn't take rocket science to know what the hell's going on he said get to my dad and i did and then the general refused to act he just wouldn't act and he said i don't have troops i even told him i said sir just pull out the orderlies the police are not acting मच्छरदानी के डंडे दे दो वहां जाके खड़े हो जाएंगे इनकी हिम्मत नहीं होगी आने को संदीप आई कैन नॉट यू नेक्स्ट डे आई वेंट टू हजारपुर मार्केट साइड एंड एवरीबडी टाइड ऑल ऑफ देम डेड इन सिटिंग पोजिशन विद टायर्स अराउंड मार्गरेट राइट बुक्स फोटोग्राफ्स ऑफ पार्टीशन दीज वो वर्स एंड इट वॉज सो सिस्टमैटिक it was sickly every plan and there wasn't much time for it to be planned because mrs gandhi had just been killed in the morning yet it happened so is it far worse than any of the conflict that you've covered in the last couple of years kargil was one where you actually we saw 
where the war entered our drawing rooms was this far worse than what we saw in 99. 1999, a war is a war. You know, you are fighting a war. I mean, I, I, I filmed it, so I, I was part of the Chorvatla attack. I was part of various other things that happened. There it's different, yeah. It's, uh, it's as brutal. Uh, in fact, I always say this, that I always pray that my children and their children and their children and all never get to really see a war. You see a man who's been shot and his body is being brought back. I mean, it's, it just shakes you up. And later when I filmed with the Pakistani POW, you realize that there's no difference between them and us. Yeah? They're exactly the same guys, you know. They're so all the, the Northern Light Infantry. Northern Light Infantry guys. So, but 84 was horrific. Was, and later that same evening, I, there was that incident where uh, from there, from Rashtrapati Bhavan, I went after the general refused to do anything. I was driving past Shanti Niketan. I had friends there. I saw their houses burning. I went there and the mob came and I faced them off. And in fact, uh, I just tweeted this photograph recently. We actually got that rifle, which Roina was covering me with. And an elephant face. gun. That you yeah, have. it's an elephant gun. It's fire. Right. If you had opened fire with that, it was like an artillery piece. Because it would have ripped into about 10 guys at one time. But, uh, oh God, it was, I mean, that is, if somebody asked me, which is the lowest, lowest, lowest point in this country's history, it's 1984. And it's that, that those two nights where it was just free for all. So it's, it's Blue Star, Operation Blue Star. You had the Sikh riots, Mrs. Gandhi's assassination, and the Union Carbide gas leak, right? In the Bhopal. 84 was also Siachen. And, and, and Siachen, actually, I got the map three years before that, in 1981, which triggered off the whole operation. Well, it partly triggered off the whole operation because Bull Kabar had also got a map from a German tourist. And then I got this US Air Force map. But 1984, as you said, that's one hell of a decade. I mean, you know, this country was on fire. Uh, Punjab was it wasn't burning. Mile sur mera tumhara. <laughs> that was also there. You see, like you got, you had Durdarshan as your only yeah. channel. Uh, it was trying like hell to unify the whole country. Right. And mind you, they did play a role. Uh, there was a, you know, we, we, we used to be very contemptuous. But they, they did a tremendous, this country was work in progress at that time as far as national identity was concerned. We didn't have it. See, we are from a generation where in the 60s and 70s, if you had a transistor in your house, you were an affluent society, I mean, a family. You mentioned that point about the ACs. This was the generation that did not know air conditioners, right? I had no idea. In fact, I used to dread air conditioned cars because it was a little bit slow, the used to conk it. You know, so if you may have, it was crazy. Uh, at the age, I mean, for one year we'd been in Fort Benning because my dad was posted with the US Army. So one was exposed to color television and ACs and all that. But if you take that out of the equation, I never seen an air conditioner till, nine, till I was 21 years old. And I think that was a wonderful thing. We didn't have anything and we yet had a very full, we, you know, that taught you how to actually really live life to the end. So I was going to ask you about the, uh, uh, the generals. I mean, you're an army uh, kid yourself. You spent a lot of time with the forces. And if you asked anyone in the army who the best general was, it, the answer would be unanimous. Field Marshal Sam Manekshaw. Now, if you ask them who the next best general in the army was, they'll all say General Sundarji, right? But uh, there's this very interesting paragraph in your book where you, uh, this quote, I'm going to read it out. This General Sundarji was brilliantly overwhelming and always full of bluster. He's like a man who opens the bonnet of a car, looks at all the wires, pulls them out, saying they're all wrong, but he has no clue how to put them back together. <laughs> That's like... Well, those aren't exactly my words. That was what my dad said. And he was right. Because I had uh, perhaps more interaction with General Sundarji. He was very good to me. Yeah. In fact, even that wildlife thing we started later. I mean, we brought this whole wildlife preservation thing under his. But he was more hype, you think, than uh, substance? Uh, that's what you seem to hint in General the General Sundarji yeah. was a man in a hurry. 1984, Blue Star was a disaster because of him. I have no doubt about that. I, having worked on General Vike's book also, I'm aware of the fact that what happened in Mrs. Gandhi's house. The DGFO, General Somana, and the Chief, General Vedya, had told Mrs. Gandhi an attack on the Golden Temple is out of the question. And he arrives from Chandigarh and suddenly he did the Chief and everybody sidelined. And I've said so. The moment you compromise military logic, you had it. You cannot do this. He did it. In fact, he, 
I got to meet him also because he wanted to know. He, he knew that I had been inside the Golden Temple. I told him, I said, sir, there's 64 LMGs inside the Golden Temple. And he told me, you journalists always exact. He immediately lost interest because I wasn't telling him what I, he wanted to hear. He actually believed that if the army turns up at the Golden Temple, they'll all come up with their hands up. And when it didn't happen, well, you know what happened. We had to send in tanks. We had to do all kinds of stuff. And it was a disaster. Same thing happened in Sri Lanka. Right? right? You've gone in with pouch and ammunition. You can't do this kind of a thing. And it happened again and again and again. So, I know a lot of people, I'm, I'm not sure if everybody in the army still rates him as the second best chief that we've had or whatever. Uh, every chief has got, has brought something to the table and the circumstances also dictate things. But when you say the best general in the Indian army, I think you've got to look beyond the, beyond the chiefs also. I mean, you've got Sagat, you've got Bebo, you've yeah. got, yeah. you've got uh, uh, you know, some outstanding people who did not become chiefs also. Right. And, and uh, you know, uh, apart from the 80s, now you're moving on to the 90s when you come to the Kargil War. Uh, what was your takeaway from that? I mean, of course, you brought it out so beautifully in your book. The, the first television war that we, uh, you know, covered, we saw the, the war for the first time had come into our living rooms. Tell us about your experience as a video journalist covering the war. And this is a war that's very, you know, the, the Pakistanis, for instance, don't even acknowledge it as a war. Their prime minister recently said, we fought three wars with India. You know, it's actually four if you count Kargil. But he was saying three. So tell us about your uh, experiences about, Kar, you know, covering Kargil. How, how, how much of a, uh, you know, a, a kick in the guts was it? Well, I'll tell you something interesting. Uh, Philip Rajkumar, who built the Tejas, the LCA, had done the RCDS course with Musharraf. And they had their get together when he was the president, and uh, Philip was going. And Philip, I, I've flown with Philip a lot, and he's a great guy. So he said to me, in his typical laid back way of talking, I'm going to Pakistan. How about giving Musharraf your Kargil film? So I said, sure, why not? So I gave him two CDs to take with him. Now Musharraf put Air Marshal uh, Philip Rajkumar in the Presidential house. He never shifted from army house. He always stayed in army house. But in presidential house, he also had a study. So when Philip got a chance, he walked across with my Cargill film to give him. The same film which we had actually briefed Clinton with late, early, earlier. And he gives it to Musharraf. And Musharraf looks at it and he says, this is that bastard who was on yours. I mean, you know, the Cargill war was India's first televised war, of course, yes. But the fact is that uh, I think there's a lot of hype around that also. Firstly, I have reservations of even calling it a war. It's more of a conflict, right? Uh, it's not taking away from the heroism of everything that happened, but it's a very limited action. It's a, it's a, it's actually, we, we they came in, they, they, they occupied certain heights, we showed a lot of resolve, we went in, we kicked them out. But that's it's not a you, war. But that's what you said about the 62 war also in your book. I, I found that very interesting. You're saying that that wasn't a full-fledged war. I think we've hyped it up more than what it was. Well, 62, of course, as you know, we had uh, <clears throat> one brigade deployed in Difa. One brigade is 3,000 soldiers. Yeah, and you know, it's like you got, we had two Rajput, we had dying Punjab, four grenades that just moved in. There was that little thing that happened. And, and the fighting was only on 20th of October, and then the fighting at Bumla on 23rd. And then on 17th of November, when they attacked Sela, what happened in Wolong was likely more intensive over a period of time. But at the most two brigades. And in Ladakh, what happened? Actually, nothing happened in Ladakh. They came, they took the area, there was a whole fighting around the Spangur Gap, the, the Gorkha Hills, etc. And then we withdrew. Luckily for us, the Chinese did not follow up on that. And they came up to what was their claim line and then they pulled back. They pulled back in, in Nifa also after. And Nifa was a... Tremendous, I mean, apart from everything else that happened in 1962, failure of command, failure of leadership, it was also, uh, it also gives you an insight into the Indian mind. And I think we are still scared of the Chinese, frankly speaking. I mean, you know, the, we, are, we are probably getting there now and we are beginning to assert ourselves a little bit. But on the world stage, I still think, you look at Doklam, you look at various things. Right. When these things have happened, we simply have not reacted the way we should. But if you look at it now, I mean, the Indian and Chinese soldiers are standing eye, eyeball to eyeball. And I think it's, what, 100,000 soldiers as we speak 
facing off on the line of control, uh, uh, line of actual control. I don't, I don't think there's anywhere in uh, world history where you know two armies have been deployed at this altitude. So, and a terrible terrain. And yeah, probably the worst. Like you know, positioning yourself on the moon or something like that. Oh, it's worse than that. At least on the moon, they say you're on the moon. Yeah, you're not on the moon, and yet it's like that. Right. I spent three years in Ladakh. I mean, that whole period with Tiger Tops. Right. And high altitude was. Uh, an experience, and I've seen men die of hypo and stuff like that. Man, right. it's, it's very, it's, very. It's terrible. fascinating. You, you got to pick up the copy of this book, uh, Hindustani, and I, I, I'm going to ask you about the title later on, uh, Kunal. It's, it's filled with. It's like I said, it's a roller coaster ride through the 80s until present day. It's like a five episode Netflix series and 500 pages. So I'm going to quickly open the floor up for questions. If there are any, please raise your hands. If you, uh, yes, this gentleman. And, uh, Sir, uh, welcome to Jaipur. Or uh, I want to ask you that there is resistance between the Hindustani or Hindustani. What you have differences between the because you have selected the Hindustani and the Hindustani. Why? Then, why, why the title? Why the, the title between this? It's not a so. typo error, as somebody once said on Twitter. He had the book. He said it was written in H. But uh, yeah, but uh, look, the way Sir. I see it, actually the original title I wanted was Six Degrees of Separation. Sir. But then we felt, well, I realized there was a film by that name, so well, that was one issue. And then I felt we needed something which actually caught the spirit of what the book was all about. Sir. You've got Hindustanis, you've got Pakistanis, you even have the odd Khalistani and you have all kinds of Afghanistanis. I said, Hindustani bhi dal dete into the mix, let's see what happens. I think in Hindustani, basically, in my definition of it is actually the way the army looks at things. You know, it's a political, a religious, everything. I mean, who you are, who you are, but it's Fortress India and your entire loyalty has to be to that. And I think everything has to just revolve around it. It doesn't matter Sir. what your ideology is, what it is. When it comes to crunch time, you've got to stand up for your country. Sir, thank you so much. Peace. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. You said, I think we are still scared of the Chinese. That's the statement you made. Um, but when we look at documentaries of the 71, um, the genocide in Bengal, uh, we always hear that the 90,000 um, Pakistani army was returned back with all respect. So are we, were we scared of uh, trying them for the genocide in Bengal? I think that's a very good question, ma'am, because actually, the fact is that the Bangladesh war has never really been declared a genocide. The West has gone out of its way for reasons of their own, because the Americans were with the Pakistani, the Chinese were with them, everybody was with them. And what actually happened, you had 3 million people who were killed, and yet nobody is willing to classify it as a genocide. Our own handling of the POWs, Sam Manikshaw was the chief. He believed that the Pakistani soldier was the Pakistani soldier. He was willing to treat them with absolute respect. And I personally respect that point of view a hell of a lot. There's another point which is very important as far as the 71 war is concerned, which I would like to now bring up. The 3 million people who were killed in Bangladesh. The Pakistani army probably, we can only give you rough figures because nobody really has a fix on it, is about... 200,000, which is not, it's not, it's not taking away from the horrendousness of the the, the, the killings, the, the university killings, the Operation Searchlight, all that is there. But the bulk of the killings, 2.8 million to 3 million people were actually killed by the Razakars. And who are the Razakars? The Razakars were the paramilitary forces within East Pakistan. So there's a lot of dynamics here which, which uh, have to be looked at. Yes, it's a pity that the Pakistani army was not brought to trial. I think some of the generals should have been tried. But don't forget one thing, ma'am. They Bhutto was playing this card to the hilt. He has actually openly he, he let he let the Indian intelligence agencies know that if you try the Pakistanis, we will kill Mujib. And bringing Mujib back alive was a very very important fact. Sorry. I'm sorry. That's all we have time for. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, do uh, get copies of uh, uh, Kunal's book, and he's available to sign copies. Thank you very much. Thank you for it. Thank you very much.